Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I am the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss metadata management from technical architecture and business techniques, sponsored today by Irwin. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag D a strategies. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to activate that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar to, or follow Donna further, you may do so at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over the webinar over to Sean from Irwin for a word from our sponsor, Sean, hello and welcome. Hello. So thank you everybody for your time today. It's an honor to be here. My name is Sean Roberts. I'm the Vice President of Solution Strategy for Irwin. Um, I think I have control. I do. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit um, about Irwin and kind of our journey first and where we are today. As most of you know, Irwin is a very well-established brand and the de facto standard in data modeling. Um, today, Erwin is used at over 3,500 customers and by more than 50,000 users around the world. In, in 2016, uh, the Erwin assets were spun off from Computer Associates as a standalone private, privately held company, and Erwin Inc. was established. So we like to say we're basically uh, now a 30-year-old a startup. Um, since then, we have heavily invested in the solution and made several acquisitions to broaden our portfolio into the leading data governance platform. Um, we've, had we've integrated these uh, acquisitions and solutions together along with uh, significant R&D, um, basically with a single goal. Uh, we want to be the only software platform with integrated capabilities for enterprise modeling, data cataloging, and data literacy. So the Erwin Edge um, basically creates an enterprise data governance experience it facilitates you know, collaboration between IT and the business users to discover, understand, govern, and socialize your data. As I said, today we're trusted by more than 3,500 uh, global customers, most of which fall within the Fortune 500. Um, we have uh, 250 employees and seven offices around the globe. We are proud of the value that we can deliver to our customers and of the satisfactory Satisfaction, basically, they show in our industry-leading net promoter score, NPS. So let me tell you about a little bit more about our mission. So, you know, basically, you know, everybody has what we've seen today is, is kind of the, with the growth and the explosion of data, um, you know, has, has, the, has the same challenge, right? Poor data management creates chaos, and as a result, we all face kind of the same common dilemma. What data do we have and where is it? And so, you know, how do you solve that? So we have a suite of tools that allow you to harvest, scan, collect, and analyze your, organize and analyze your data. Once that's complete, our solution will allow you to analyze it. You can, you have complete end-to-end -end visibility of the mappings to see how your data is being federated throughout your organization. This allows you to see the complete data journey down to the system table and column. We also label, enable you to link your business terms and definitions to your data elements and dictionary and enabling you to structure and govern your data. Data is never at rest, right? It's constantly moving, evolving, and changing. So when you have DDAs and data modelers constantly making updates uh, to your data sources are going in your, then your data sources are going through rapid states of change. So we have a set of tools that allow you to version the data, audit those changes, as well as the ETL processes that are moving and transforming that data through the complete data lifecycle change process. Having the ability to version and audit the data through the lifecycle process then is the foundation for true governance. We also provide you the tools to visualize the data and the relationships among the data so you can vision, <coughs> excuse me, visualize and um, manage your data landscape, right? You can see where your data is within your organization, how it's evolving, changing, how it's being used and who it's being used by, which enables you to then institute a true and robust data governance model with best practices and establish, you know, a single source of truth for enterprise socialization of data assets. 
So this next slide uh, is intended, it's very busy, but it's intended to be busy. It's uh, what we consider representative of typical large organizations. It represents the types of tools that they use, they have and use today, your ERC system, systems, your high performance database systems, your operational systems, various ETL and ELT tools, as well as BI reporting solutions. So if you're gonna have a proper governance program, you also have to have the ability to catalog your data sources understand the meanings and definitions, and you also need a robust set of connectors that can reach into these tools, automatically catalog them, and document how the data is being processed so you can understand the uses patterns of your data. For Erwin, this is really our sweet spot, and what we do extremely well. We have the industry's broadest set of connectors. We've got over 125, and we're continuing to grow in these connectors, um, and, and these connectors can tap into all these tools and technologies that you see uh, on this screen here. So this is a representation of a fairly typical data warehouse architecture. Probably looks very familiar to almost everybody. Um, and this is what we see for most mature large organizations, how they store, process, and organize the data. You have multiple CRMs, third-party inputs that come into your organization, land and stage your raw databases, then are typically moved to an operation data store, even a data lake. This all then gets pulled into a data warehouse structure, followed by your analytical service layer, and then on into your BI layer for visibility. So Erwin can automatically catalog and document all of these data structures and data sources you see here, and display the data journey for every asset with the impact analysis and full in and lineage. We can also link your business glossary terms, policies, and rules to your data elements so that you can see your data structure at a glance, so you can know instantly where all your impactful data is, such as PII or HIPAA, where it's stored and who has access to it. So we're seeing a, a few, you know, kind of the three primary market, key market trends um, in data today, and those are automation, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and data lineage and its impact. Right, and so, you know, everyone has answers to all these trends, right? For automation, you know, we, we automatically scan, harvest, and document all of your data sources. We continue to develop and add new data connectors, you know, as I said, regularly. Um, for AI and ML, today we automatically link business terms um, and the data assets automatically document your lineage. And our AI roadmap includes more than uh, eight additional use cases in the next six to 12 months. So we're heavily invested in that. And then, you know, like I said earlier, you know, our true sweet spot now is the enterprise um, lineage and impact. Today we can show, you know, both the upstream and downstream impacts at, you know, a source, a table, all the way down to the column level, um, who's using it, who it's being used by, and, and where your data is being federated out. So that kind of brings us to, you know, our metadata management vision here. And so from, from, an urban standpoint, basically, you know, we, we, we broke that down into five areas, right? So data intelligence is where we continue to enhance um, our data intelligence suite. It's got a data catalog serving as a single source of truth for all of our customers. Our enhancements include, you know, AI and all things um, as a guiding technology principle. And we're ensuring we help customers automate data operations and innovate their data intelligent connections, assumptions, and next best actions. Security Aware is another one. Um, our key customers are large regulated enterprises that store data in the cloud, behind firewalls, and in unstructured environments and other locations they, can and they can't yet envision, right? And so that's, you know, data security is paramount, um, but often at odds with the metadata management in terms of accessibility. So our security infrastructure roadmap provides automated tools to meet security requirements and automatically access and document um, data regardless of its location which is another, you know, a good solid, solid sweet spot for us. We also have real-time monitoring. So the Erwin Data Catalog includes patent technology that automatically refreshes and versions data on a scheduled basis. Um, we continue to extend this capability and will include real-time monitoring support for, for customers where an on-demand data intelligence is required. And then semantic modeling. So semantic models show the intersection of business requirements and the business and technical infrastructure needed to satisfy them. And our, set, our semantic modeling capability enables customers to analyze, specify, and communicate an organizational wide view of data's role within the business from multiple perspectives. And then finally, 
um, the active metadata. So we have a very robust um, platform. Open APIs are important to our strategy for active metadata. And we have already activated Erwin uh, DM metadata through APIs and connectivity to a wide uh, array of tools, including repositories, database management systems, data integration tools, and other suites. And the data intelligence suite is becoming a fully open, is uh, fully open via our API platform. All right, so we strive to have a visionary impact um, on the metadata solution market today with our data intelligence platform and taking an active metadata approach. Um, being data driven, we uh, allows us to offer speed to insights and our connectors allow for tracking data in motion as well as data at rest. And you know, finally, our, we have a significant focus on data quality as well. So at the data governance, as a data governance company, Irwin provides data modeling, you know, breaking down of organizational and technical silos for collaboration across um, key data business architectures. And this is a key part of our data intelligence um, suite and our edge, uh, Irwin Edge data and governance experience. Um, our data catalog and data literacy suite enables you, like I said, to automate data operations, provide business users with better visibility. And together, these products combine you know, what we call the Enterprise Data Governance Experience, or EDGE. Um, the data in, this provides data-driven insights, agile innovation, regulatory compliance, and business transformation, with data governance as a hub and driving principle. You know, so the enterprise and its critical architectures are connected to enable discovery, understanding, governance, and even socialization, socialization of data assets and supporting information. We do this and we see this as an ability, a way to reduce risk and realize desired operational results. So at Erwin, we believe that data is everyone's business, everyone's responsibility. It's not just a single person. And so the data journey is very important to us and who touches it and how we enable those that touch it and use it and consume it. So ensuring that we're meeting the needs of data consumers across the enterprise value chain, whether it's IT, business, or data operations people. So this is the key to unlocking the power and the value of your data and powering digital transformation. <coughs> so what do we mean by digital trans transformation? So in our experience, customers are looking to become data driven in really four key areas, right? Improving digital experiences, so bridging data together with a variety of touch points across the enterprise to better understand and optimize the way the business interacts and supports its customers, enhancing digital operations. Most organizations are spending a tremendous amount of time in manual data prep and need to dramatically reduce time to insights for analytics projects. A driving di digital innovation is regardless of the industry, organizations are looking for compelling competitive advantages and leveraging data to deliver new products and disrupt with new business models. Um, examples of those are Uber and Urban, uh, sorry, Uber and Amazon, and are you know part of virtually every uh, technology charter. And then finally, building a digital ecosystem. So no one can do it to, alone today in today's market. So companies need to build platforms and partnerships that allow you to accelerate scale and growth. Sean, this is amazing. We're right out over the uh, ten minutes, so we do want to make sure we move on to Don. Anything to wrap up? And yep. So sorry, I thought I was going fast enough. I apologize. So yeah, so, I just, so I, all I have next is just a, a set of kind of screenshots on the slides. And it basically gives you an idea, you know, data stewardship and curation, um, integrated data profiling and data quality scoring, an integrated business glossary, on-demand dynamic data lineage, on-demand impact analysis for both upstream and downstream, and then on-demand mind mapping. So. That's all I have. Thank you, everyone, again. I appreciate the opportunity to present, and uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Sean. This is fantastic. And there are questions coming in. Um, so just so you all know, Sean will be joining us in the Q&A section at the end of the uh, presentation today with Donna. So uh, we will be sure to get to those questions. And now I want to do, do want to turn it over to Donna. You all know her. You love her. She's the speaker of our, this monthly webinar series. I'm not going to go into too much uh, you, about her right now so we can move on to the presentation. Um, with that, I will give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Donna, hello and welcome. Hi. 
Thank you. Always a pleasure uh, to chat. Um, and as Shannon mentioned in the beginning and was kind of touched on by the sponsor, uh, today's topic is metadata, something we all know and love. Um, and as you know, metadata is as much a technical um, challenge as it is a business challenge. So today we'll talk about, about the intersection of those. Um, and as the previous speaker mentioned, that, you know, there's a lot of people involved in metadata and how to get those roles aligned with things like data governance. Um, you all know me and hopefully love me. I don't know. Thank you, Shannon. Um, <laughs> one thing is probably worth noting, and full disclosure, I am I am ex Irwin, um, and one of those books is Data Modeling with Irwin. So if you're interested, in that, <laughs> buy the book. Um, no, but a, a solid product, and I see some familiar faces on the uh, on the attendees from that. So thanks for joining. Um, so again, uh, today is metadata. If you've missed any of the previous webinars, as you know, uh, most likely this is a, a monthly event. Uh, we often have some of the same familiar faces, which is great. Uh, and often you guys come up and say hi at the conferences, which is even better. Um, so if you missed any of the others, Shannon will uh, send out a reminder in the emails. Um, these are all on demand, so you can catch them um, again and again. <laughs> and please join us next month. We'll be talking about data quality with my partner in crime from the UK, um, or Wales, uh, Nigel Turner. So. I will talk more about that when we close it out. So without further ado, um, today we talk about metadata um, and the fact that metadata really is that context around data. And you know, metadata is one of the most obvious things that we gave the most difficult word for. <laughs> metadata just sounds nerdy, so I think we did ourselves a disservice in the industry there. But um, <clears throat> because it is created both by business and IT, um, and there are, you know, that can be complex, you know, as, as uh, Sean mentioned, that there's a lot of different types of information, a lot of different types of user. There is some practical ways to get started, um, and, and we hopefully can give you some ways to demystify that in the presentation today. So again, uh, metadata is that who, what, where, why, and when, and how, and how many <laughs> of those there are. Um, and I, I put this together because I thought it was just a, a helpful way to think about that because, again, metadata is sort of a nerdy word, um, but this demystifies a little bit. So who created the data? Who's the steward? Who's using it? Um, often just finding out that can be the most helpful piece of information. Um, yes, I can read the definition, but I have more questions. Who do I go to? Right? When we think of what, that's often what we think of traditionally, or at least I have in the past with metadata. You know, what's the definition of this? What's the business rule? What's the data type? What's the structure? What's the format? Is there an abbreviation for a common you know, element? Um, and, and that's super valuable, but that's not the only thing. Uh, part of it is the where. When we talk about things like lineage, where is the data stored? Where did it come from? Where is it used? What's the impact if we make a change? Are there, <clears throat> where is this data used in the terms of regional um, or security or privacy rules? You know, is, is the data used in Germany different than the data used in the UK versus the US? And each country has its own specific uh, regional laws, so you need to be aware of that even more so in today's day and age. Why is always a good one to think about. Um, and so many of, of my uh, customers now are sort of joke, we do the Marie Kondo of data, right? <laughs> of sort of why are we storing this data? Um, it, what is the purpose? What is the highest priority? No one can do everything. So starting with priorities is almost the best way to start. Also, there's a risk. So um, I, I tweeted this a few weeks ago. One of my customers had the best line, so I stole it. He said, some data is like nuclear waste. you just too risky to keep it. Just, you know, yes, we might be great to have somebody's credit score and their social security number, their social insurance number in Canada, et cetera. Um, unless we really need it, do we want to put ourselves at that exposure? So a lot of companies I'm working with are really thinking closely about that why. Or storage. You know, back to the Marie Kondo, uh, <laughs> this stuff is expensive to store if we don't really need it. So yes, a data lake can be great, um, but just storing data for data's sake isn't always the wisest thing. So metadata can definitely help with that, uh, as well as things like governance to get to that why. When, super helpful. Uh, when was this data created? When was it last updated? And then when we think of things like retention, um, how long should it be stored? Um, what, what are, are there rules around that? Uh, if there aren't rules as part of our governance, is there just practical common sense? Do we need to keep every customer transaction for the last 100 years? Maybe not. Um, so then, if not, when do we purge and delete it, and then how? And there's so many great options now with the cloud in terms of cold storage and different options that you know, we didn't have before or some need to be on paper, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the how is kind of like the what. Um, you know, how is the data formatted? Um, how is it stored in the database? And things like that. So I, I find this helpful as kind of a holistic way to look at the data. Um, when you're looking at metadata, am I capturing everything? Am I so focused on the what that I've forgotten the why? 
and it's also a nice way to sort of explain it to people if people say matter what, you know, it kind of explains that in a nice way. Uh, there's several um, ways to look at metadata, uh, as you may know. There's kind of the business view of that as well as the technical view. Uh, all synergy and happiness when those two can be linked together. And there's a lot of great tools in the market that can help you do that, and that's super valuable. Of Yes, here's the definition of, I don't know, customer identifier, and here's the 17 places in the databases where this is linked, especially with things like GDPR and the California Protection you know, Privacy Laws super important to be really thinking of that, of where my data is stored across the organization, which gets back to the why. Do I need it stored in this many places, or should I master it, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, business definitions, things like what is a customer, and we could wax poetic about that all day. In fact, in one of these webinars a few months ago, people had a really fun time in the chat with some of their, you know, different definitions of common things. You know, what is a customer? What is a product? Things that in normal life seem so basic until you start doing things like data modeling and metadata, and you can see all of the subtleties and, and beauty of that. Um, and then technical metadata, which, of course, things like the data type, the definition, the standards, the domains, is it nullable, what are the keys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a wealth of information on both sides. Um, and you want to kind of understand who <laughs> wants to see which, so what you don't want to do is show the business people all of the the keys and the nullability rules, and you know, it's a good way to, to alienate them. I guess I would argue that everyone should see the business metadata, especially people building the technology. But think of the, you know, the audiences as well. Uh, because uh, metadata is part of a larger enterprise landscape, I mean, one way one could build this framework. That if you've joined my webinars, you see each time because it's something we always refer back to because everything here is so interrelated. Metadata, I, I would love to see it almost a circle around this entire diagram, right? Metadata helps with understanding the business and the business drivers. It understands with, helps with governance and traceability and lineage. It helps with some of your basic data, you know, asset planning and inventory. Do I even know what I have and what the data looks like and how it's structured? Um, so it really is key to everything. But it is its own practice in its own right. And I think sometimes, because it's so ubiquitous and so embedded in everything else, it's sort of the unsung hero <laughs> uh, amongst all of these. You, know, you can't do good master data management without metadata. You can't have great quality unless you understand the metadata. Um, but when it's working well, uh, it's sort of everything goes smoothly and no one thinks about it. Right? <laughs> I guess that's, that's, a, that's a problem of IT in general, right? When things are working well, they forget about you. <laughs> I guess sometimes it's good to be forgotten. But... Um, that that is you know so ubiquitous that it's, it's worth mentioning as part of this larger framework, and it's harder than ever uh, for a lot of reasons. And it was touched on by the sponsor that um, not only are there more technologies and, and more database platforms we need to manage, and more systems, but more people are looking at the data. And I think personally that's the bigger bigger reason. As more people look at the data, they want to know what it means. Um, so this is a shameless plug for a survey we did with or I did with Dataversity few years ago um, that is still very relevant in the fact that we looked at emerging trends in metadata management. And if anyone had any doubt, and you probably don't if you're on this webinar or listening to it after the fact, that metadata is hot. And so we wanted to get the metric, right? We're data people. We wanted the metric around this. Uh, over 80% said metadata is not only as important, but probably more important than it was in the past. And again, no surprises to me and probably not to many people on the call. There's just, as you look at the data, how can you not <laughs> look at the metadata? In fact, I've, I've used this line before, but I'll use it again because it was so fitting. Um, when I was in a technical role, we were sort of going to the business sponsor and trying to get buy-in for a metadata repository with lineage and a glossary and trying to show that if you want this business intelligence report, you need to know where the data came from and what it means. And the sponsor looked at us and she said, <laughs> almost with shock, she was from finance, and said, you mean you're not doing this already? <laughs> that scares me. You know, when you think of someone from finance, they can't get away with that saying, oh, kind of have a lot of money in the bank. Not exactly sure, but you know, we don't have time for things like that. We're agile. We just pay our bills fast and we don't pay attention to how much they are and where they came from. You know, other industries just can't get away with that. For many reasons, data we sort of have. Um, and I think now that more people are looking at it, the very obvious questions come up. How is this calculated? You know, where did it come from? What does it mean? Who's using it? Who owns it? Who stewards it? All of that. And that's, that's metadata. Um, so on that point of who, you, who uses metadata, again, from the survey, there's some nice metrics around that. Um, you'll see that there's a wide range of people who use metadata. It isn't just data architects or data modelers or DBAs. Uh, you'll see that business users is, is a high range up there. You know, BI reporting isn't, isn't a surprise there. Data scientists, of course. Um, but yeah, I did find that interesting in 
maybe obvious that business users were actually the largest audience of in this survey of metadata um, because they're the ones using the data. They want to know how that field was calculated, what the you know, how the data was was sourced, what it means. Um, so this is data to prove that fact. Um, and again, just a little more about that. Um, you know, eighty percent of the the users are from the business. One of the quotes from that survey. Um, I liked, so we called out was, you know, the metadata is that that concept that helps both IT and the business understand the data they're working with. Without it, they're at risk for making decisions based on the wrong data, right? And and so, the, you know, the business, you know, the business guy in the corner, how is this total sales figure calculated? He, he really wants to know his bonus might be on based on that or his commission or his job if he's CEO. We need to know, is this total revenue from or is it total, you know, from all regions, does it have uh, commissions taken out? Is it retail sales, hotel sales, et cetera? I mean, there's so many ways to calculate total sales um, that you really want to be clear on that. And I find when you're trying to, quote, sell metadata, often the business gets it more than IT does. I think IT often sees it as a burden. Oh, I know this stuff. Gosh, do I have to tell other people I'm too busy? Um, and maybe that's true. Uh, but as more people are looking at it and for it, uh, it you, you can't live without it. So often, you know, selling into the business is a great way to kind of get sponsorship for these things. I thought this was helpful, too, that was sort of behind the scenes in the survey. Um, I was curious about this other, which is, you know, a fairly good percentage there. You'll see it's about 20% kind of listed other. Um, and I thought some of the answers were very interesting. Clients, um, uh, external data providers, general public. A couple of our clients are government organizations that are doing uh, some open data initiatives. And, you know, of course you can't use open data unless that you know, you know what that open data means. Um, and so metadata is just completely obvious to them. We didn't have to sell that at all. They said, of course, how could you publish data without the, you know, the directory of what that data means? Um, you'll see some terms there, regulators and, um, uh, you know, uh, audit and things like data governance. Um, often there's the carrot and the stick. You know, maybe I don't want to publish the metadata, but I'll certainly get in trouble if I don't. <laughs> um, I thought it was interesting things like research and scientists and students. And, you know, as people are doing research, exactly, they need to know the context behind this. And anyone who is doing research, a number used in the wrong context could have a completely different meaning. When you did this, this piece of research, what were your parameters around that data that was collected is critical. Um, and then I, I also like some of these extras because one of the my pet peeves is we sort of generalize into well there's technical people and there's business people which really makes so little sense it's just it's, it's easier for us to say that well you know your your business users might be actuaries which are data scientists before data scientists were around right or your tech your non technical people might be research scientists well they're certainly technical they're just not a database administrator right um, and business people uh, becoming more technical and, and many people from quote IT you know, if you're sort of that data architect, I, I would argue sometimes the data architect can uh, know more about the business than anyone else because they know the data. I told this story before, but you know that never stops me from telling it again. Um, I did some work at a water company a couple of years ago, and I was there for about a week, and I did my first draft of a data model, and I presented it to the business users at the logical level, and one of the guys said, oh, this is great. It's such a clear way to explain exactly what we do. How many years have you been here? I've <laughs> been here a week, <laughs> and it wasn't that I'm particularly smart. You know, I'd like to think so, but it's really just those artifacts of data modeling is it really susses out that core logic of the business, um, which is metadata um, that everyone can understand. And I like that last quote. You know, everybody is using metadata. They just don't know it yet. Um, and maybe because it's that funny word, metadata. Yeah, well, oh, you mean the glossary? Yeah, I look at that every day for these acronyms. I'm just a new employee. I don't know what this term means. I didn't know that was metadata. I know I'm just using it, right? So... Um, I wouldn't worry what we call it as long as people are doing it, right? Um, so who uses metadata? I don't want to overdo this point, but you know, I thought this was helpful when you look. You know, everyone could be looking at the same information, uh, but in a different way. You know, maybe the developer wants to know, if I change this field, what's got to be affected? Um, I sort of wish more folks did this. In fact, I, I, I keep my client data very, very uh, close to the chest, but in the past two months, the number of major almost auditable breach issues that have happened with several major customers I'm looking at working with um, that were caused by metadata. You, know, you know, sort of remind yourself, wow, this is still happening in this day and age. Uh, one of them was a developer that changed a field um, without governance and without doing impact analysis and shut down the sales system. <laughs> so uh, 
these things still happen. This was last year, right? So um, some of them was, you know, what is the definition of sales or customer? Uh, we had one people twice in the past year, people selling, sending out mailings to the wrong list of people. So people who don't aren't customers get renewal notices or people who are customers get a sales notice. I still get those from my bank every every week from the past several years. They, they don't know my system. You know, so these things still happen. So maybe it's foundational, things like metadata. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done because they have such an impact. It's such a simple thing uh, to document some of this stuff and to do those checks, or it can be, um, and the, the downstream effect can be massive. So, um, and, and again, that last one I mentioned, uh, that example of how do we get up to speed in our company's business terminology, often that is an un, underthought of quick win. Um, I know the first thing I do when I go to a client is create my own glossary because I'm a big old nerd partly, but also it helps me, you know, the, the hardest thing. I remember when I was first in IT, the, in, in doing consulting, the most painful thing was getting an acronym. And you say, oh, my gosh, is this something like XML that I'm supposed to know? And if I don't, I look stupid? Or is this the QBR division of the company? And I, have, I shouldn't know that because that's something within them. So that's why things like acronyms and glossaries and definitions, everybody has that when you go to a new company. Everyone loves acronyms, everyone loves terms, and everyone uses terms differently. So creating something that's easy, you know, could it just be a SharePoint or a wiki or a, you know, a website, um, that's some metadata, metadata there that you can get some visibility from people. Who creates metadata? Well, probably the same people, right? Or is that somebody else's job? Wouldn't it be great if someone else did all those great definitions? And, you know, that's the hard part, right? Everyone knows it's a good idea. But I'm too busy, and well, I know the stuff, um, so it'd be great. I know if you know I clean my dishes in the company kitchen, um, that helps other people. But I'm busy and I don't. Until you realize someone else hasn't cleaned their dishes, then it's not very nice, right? So that's the problem. You know your data, so you're less motivated to document it. But once you realize that other people move uh, document their data. It's a lot more helpful, and, and we'll talk a little bit later about this idea of collaboration tools. I think that's gone a long way. It makes it seem more like a community of information sharing and less like a job that you have to do and a, a negative task. I think as more people see the value and, and I share a little bit, you share a little bit, and that collective sharing becomes a conversation um, where, oh, that's how you, you define total sales. Good to know. I was doing it differently. Let's change my report, or can I borrow your query, and things like that. And a lot of these modern data catalogs really have that different approach, which I think is great. Um, data governance is, you know, it was talked about in the introduction, you almost can't talk about metadata without governing, you know, they're sort of overlapping efforts. I, I would say, you know, what's metadata, what's governance, what's, you know, the governance is really the people, process, roles, and organizational structure. Um, things like metadata can help with governance, you know, a big part of governance is having naming standards, data lineage, data models, metadata. Um, and, and back to the who creates this, I think this chart is a nice way to look at it. Huge big caveat, you know, I build data governance models for a living, and, and the first thing I always say is that they should be customized for your company. This is just an example. Please don't take this and say, well, Donna said on the slide that the data steward is the one that creates the business rules. Maybe it isn't in your organization, or maybe you use a different term. It's, these are fairly common enough um, that you can't go too wrong when looking at them, but it's just indicative, right, it's an idea. Um, but there's different levels of metadata and different people who have different ownership, and they should have ownership or stewardship or an official responsibility to when the buck stops here. Um, so, for example, the business data owner, that's generally, I, I have that as a higher level manager. Um, there's a KPI. I'm, I'm having total, I'll keep using total sales, so I'll stick with it, right? We're, we're talking to the board about total sales this quarter. I am going to be accountable for this calculation, and you know, I'm not going to change it to make my numbers look better. I'm going to be held to that. I'm going to make sure all the salespeople are using that same KPI. That should be a business person. Yes, the, the BI analyst might have created that report, but he or she is not the one that's responsible for the calculation of that KPI or if those numbers are wrong. The buck doesn't stop at the person who built the report. The buck stops at the business owner. Um, so KPIs or metrics. Um, also things like regulatory guidelines and policy. So you could say, yes, that could be legal or it could be an external uh, agency, but you know, if we're talking that we need to be GDPR compliant or there's certain banking regulations we need to follow or I'm a hospital and there's HIPAA rules, that's the business that really needs to be accountable for that if something goes wrong um, and make sure people are understanding what that means. You know, HIPAA, that's a data thing, but there's a lot more to HIPAA than just getting your data rules right, and that really is a business thing. Similarly, in the steward, I generally see that as one level down. 
that might be your definition of the terms or your business rules or these acronyms. And, and maybe it's the owner, maybe it's the steward. It kind of depends how big your company is or those are the same person. Um, but probably, you're, you know, if, if you think of the business data owner as your VP or your, your director, yes, they would want to know the KPI that I'm being held to. Probably doesn't want to sit down and do a glossary with you. Um, and I've seen too many projects fail where people get the wrong level of person doing the wrong thing where people really do get a senior level, C-level staff person saying, could you please look at all these data definitions or the lineage of these reports? And funny, they never want to come back again. And you want to get the right level of metadata for the right person. Uh, data architect, I think that's a special role in that they sort of sit between the business. As I mentioned, they can speak the business, but they can also speak tech. Uh, they build things like data models or naming standards, or they are often responsible for these metadata tools that can do things like data lineage. Uh, they do the semantic modeling and, th and things like that. Um, I put this role of a system data steward, the guy with the funny hair. Um, I like that icon, so I put him in there. Um, this doesn't always make sense, and, and I, you, know, you could validly push back and say, mm, you shouldn't do your governance based on systems. You should do it on business, and that's true in a perfect world where everything's ideal and we have a perfect modeled enterprise where everything's clean, but so many times, your business is running on an ERP system or your CRM system or your you know, point of sale system at the front, and they're so embedded into your business rules um, and they work a certain way. So having a person that knows that system and is responsible for the data of that system, uh, and part of the way they're responsible for it is to make sure it aligns with business rules. So many times when we come in and, and try to fix a problem, the problem might be we bought a CRM system and it doesn't work. Well, it's probably not a problem with a CRM system. It may be, uh, but those CRM systems have certain rules embedded in them, and often they don't match your data model. Um, I have one client that's a reference of ours, and I'm particularly proud of. They're a small nonprofit, and they had this problem with their HR system. They brought the HR system. It didn't work. They hadn't sort of looked at it until after the fact. Once they got more mature with their data, they realized the problem wasn't the HR system. It was how they had implemented it with the data. Learned their lesson. Now they have an enterprise data model. When they have any vendor come in, they say, could you please look, show your data model and how that, that um, compares to our rules and make sure, at least if it doesn't match, how your system can be customized. Surprised the heck out of the vendors. Um, and there was a few little, don't, you know, don't wear your pretty little head. I don't think you mean something like a data model until they pulled it out and said, yes, here's the one <laughs> in our data modeling tool on the wall, and we want to know how this relationship is stored in your system. And it worked. They were actually generally most of the time able to make that, but the, they had to kind of push back. So having that data model and understanding your business rules is huge. Um, and that system data steward should be the one being able to customize that system or understanding. And, you know, sometimes you can't fix the system, but at least you know uh, where there may be a difference, and they understand that. And then the DBA or the kind of new newfangled way to look at that as a data engineer. That could be a whole webinar in of itself. Um, they're the one, super important role, who implements the physical metadata, who does the naming standards and the data types and the, you know, all of that within the system. So what governance can do is not only make these roles part of their day job. There is actual role and responsibility. Sometimes that's even put in your HR uh, job responsibility, um, if, if, if nothing else, is part of the data governance organization. You are held accountable for that. And that, that's so much a part of it. Everyone loves to read metadata. It's when it comes down to creating it. And that's really when governance pops in. Um, and this kind of gets back to that of, you know, avoid that dreaded, I just know. I mean, so much of business metadata is just in your head, and I hear that all the time of why, why would I document something like part number or customer? That seems so obvious. But generally, just think of it, there's some extra step. Oh, customer, well, that's only when they buy a product. The other ones are prospects, or that's not a member. That's a different definition. A customer is someone who's a member who bought some products from us, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much subtlety. So just write it down. Um, and take it out of people's heads and, and put it in tools. Um, and that, as I mentioned already, a lot of these more modern um, repository tools or catalogs, or whatever you want to call it, really have that way of, of doing that sharing and making it more of a conversation and having open editing. Um, but, but choose your tool very wisely. There's good tools and bad tools, and there's um, good tools in the wrong use case. And I've seen both. Um, there's a type of tool out there, and, and there's, there's tools that can do both uh, of these, but it's a different modality of your metadata, and just think about it before you implement. If you're doing something, and it could be different types of data in your or same organization, you could have both. If you're talking about things like master data, I would think you would want that very highly vetted. 
yes, these are our master data fields. This is the data type. Please don't change the length of the product code. That's the customer I mentioned earlier that brought down their sales system because somebody did that. <laughs> you do not touch this. This is our master data. There are rules. This is for your information only. You now know. Or, or things like data warehousing, your enterprise data statistics, your, your KPIs that you're you know, sending to the board. Can't really mess with those. Those are highly audited. Please don't go in and change them. Very different from doing some data science or some self-service analytics, and you want that idea of, hey, I'm using this calculation for net promoter score. Did you think about asking people when they're walking out of the store what they think rather than doing a survey? Hey, that's a great idea. Maybe we could, et cetera, et cetera. You want that kind of collaboration, and you often get to a great answer by having that back and forth. And even with the encyclopedia, you should have some sort of feedback to say, uh, guys, you have this as a standard, but by the way, this group isn't using it or that doesn't work for us or something. Um, but think of that carefully before you implement, because I've seen companies that were sort of wowed by a great interface with this kind of Wikipedia approach, um, and then they weren't able to do things like GDPR compliance and lineage because it wasn't strict enough. Um, I've also seen people who bought the one that was too strict and then people didn't like it because they weren't able to collaborate. And so just neither one is good nor bad. You just want to make sure it it fits with your use case um, or the right use case in your your particular project. And that's kind of this point of just find that right balance. Are, are you really trying to enforce standards and or are you trying to do collaboration and what's the right balance between that? And, and when you do look at these tools, I always recommend, um, and we've got some templates at our organization of these, just, just and you can create them yourself easy enough. Like what, what am I, before I look at the tool, what are my requirements? Who are the users? Is it a business tool? Is it a technical tool? Because it's so easy to get wowed by some of these great user interfaces, and they just look really cool. And then you realize, wait, that's not really what I wanted. So should it go in before you look at it? It's like going into, I don't know, look look for a kitten before you realize that you don't need a pet. That was a stupid idea. But you know what I mean. You see it, it looks cute, um, but you want to actually have your requirements um, before you look for those tools. What these tools can do are great. Um, when we get now more to the technical side, um, it's really top down and, and bottom up. So one of it, no, no metadata is created by the per, uh, person. You know what a lot of these tools can do, and it was alluded to in the introduction from the, the sponsor, was that most of these metadata tools have some sort of scanner or crawler or searcher, or they all have their own word for it. Where basically, if it's in a structured data source of some sort, if it's in a relational database or an XML file or you've done an ETL rule with some lineage, it can extract that because it's basic. There's something behind it it can read. And, and they, you know, they're worth their price because they have the logic to know how to read a COBOL copy book and a DB2 database and an AWS bucket and a et cetera, et cetera. Right? It's just, I'm not going to belittle the effort to do that. Um, but once they've done that, those can be fairly easy um, to use in that I don't want to oversimplify it, but it isn't too far from you press the button and you get a nice – schema of this database. Um, and so that you can also often get the wow factor from metadata of just buying some of these tools to really get an inventory of what you have. That's often the first step. But somebody created the structure of that database, right? So um, that's often where this top down, some of the tools, you know, the, the sponsor is a data modeling tool. Those are actually great for I'm going to design the, the database. I'm going to create those technical standards. And the beauty of that is that it's active metadata. You pre you Again, I don't want to overpromise, but sort of, you press the button and DDL is formed uh, because you've done all the, the work in a picture and a, and a model. And then when you make the changes, you make changes from the model. So uh, there, it's really amazing things you can do. And if you're not looking at that and you're doing a lot of this manually, you know, business metadata is sort of a manual thing because it's people and, and you know, that, some of that can be automated, uh, but mostly that is a human effort. Things like glossaries it kind of has to have people. Um, a lot of the technical metadata should be aut automated. If you're doing a manual mapping and a spreadsheet um, for all of your ETL rules and you're using an ETL tool, there's probably an easier way. Um, so probably worth looking at this. And if you're not using one of these tools for the creation of your metadata, you might look at that because it just makes it simpler. You can also sort of do the testing before you implement, right? So beauty of some of these data models is, you know, I can do the impact analysis. I can argue about the table columns with the team and really get that worked out before I am actually making this live into production or even into the test environment. Uh, this is a very common way to look at this, that almost classic data lineage from here is my total sales again, to overdo that analogy. Um, I have total sales this quarter. Where did that come from? What, where was the data warehouse field? Uh, what, what dimensional model? You know, what are the facts and, and 
mentions on here. What, what did it come from the staging area and what's the source? And, and most of these tools on the market, again, you have to have some of it automated in the, in the back so it has something to read, you know, something stored in a, in a ETL tool or a database or it, it's going to be lost. But so much of this can be automated pretty nicely, and there's a lot of uh, nice visual tools where both from the business user and the technical user, you can kind of drill down, either just see a high-level lineage like the one I showed, and a lot of them can actually drill down and see the columns. So if you're doing things like GDPR or any lineage or just want to know that your data is right, I, I would kind of look at some of these tools because they, they do a lot of stuff. Um, and I Okay, I'm going to just slightly rant here. So often when I show this type of thing, people think, oh, that's very old school. That's data warehousing, uh, which no one does anymore, but everybody does still. <laughs> they might do it in the cloud, and they might do something with like a snowflake or a, uh, well, I shouldn't mention product names, but you know, there are more modern, faster ways uh, to do some data warehousing. But the co core uh, business need of understanding total sales by month doesn't go away, um, and you still need this sort of lineage. And so I do find it interesting. This is a classic. I, I will admit we use this kind of diagram in the 90s, and yes, I'm old. Um, but we, we, this is a classic, but it still happens. This is something I, you know, full disclosure from AWS, Amazon, Glue, right? It's the same idea. I might be an Amazon S3 and using Redshift. I still need to know the lineage, and they might call it a, cr a crawler and not a scanner, and they have a data catalog, not a metadata repository. And there are differences between them. Um, but again, if there's some structure there and there's some way that this data was, was moved, you can get it. Um, and so you know, think, of the, think of your sources, do your inventory, look at what your data catalogs and your metadata repositories can support. You, know, you don't want to get the wrong tool that doesn't support your sources. But there's a lot of great tools out there that can, can automate a lot of this. So again, if you're doing mappings by spreadsheet, please don't. Um, a lot of be probably better ways to use your, your valuable brain. Um, and and the you know Sean mentioned in the beginning some machine learning and metadata discovery. Uh, I get nervous when I say AI machine learning because that is such an overused buzzword right now. But um, whatever we call it, the, I, I do think there are some ways to automate a lot of the stuff we did manually. You know, I remember way back in my early days, yes, having to kind of map out the SSN, the social security number, and all the different flavors that might be social security number. Um, and that's something that a machine can do really well. I think even machines get bored with that for the cartoon there, right? Uh, but that, you know, machines can find these patterns of, oh, I have NN number, number, dash, number, dash, number, 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 number. That looks like a security, social security number in the U.S. Maybe that's something I could kind of automate those pattern matching. That is great. That is something that we didn't have years and years ago. And, and look for a tool that supports that. Um, but there's also sometimes where you do want to have specific mapping rules. I want to know that I want my naming standard to be, I don't know, um, understore CO for company, or does that mean Colorado, or does that mean, you, you, you know, there's certain things you want your own specific mapping rules. And again, just like that, do you want the encyclopedia or Wikipedia type repository? Think of it when you're, so many vendors, I think, is my own personal opinion here, um, are going so much to the machine learning rules, sometimes they skimp on the fact when you really want to be able to do that mapping. I guess my analogy is a Google search is great, uh, where you just want to say, I don't know, tell me everything about, uh, I don't know, uh, golden retrievers because I think I'm going to buy one, right? And you got all this great stuff about golden retrievers. But sometimes, um, you know, Zappos is a great example uh, where I want to say that I want to buy a woman's tennis shoe in size 8 in blue, and then you can get very specific. And I think sometimes when people are kind of wooed by the Google search, and then when you start to look at it, you realize, oh, I can't get that specific. So this is the same sort of thing. I want to be able to have that rules-based approach and just make sure you can do both if you need to do both. Um, just quickly, um, when you look at architectural office for metadata management, there is a lot, and it can be overwhelming. And there, just like anything, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. You may need um, a full-on metadata repository or a metadata catalog is sort of the new word for that. And there's a meta-metadata in there. I had to get that in there. So they have a meta-model. So what kind of metadata can they store out of the box? And, and one of the reasons these guys have a price tag that they do is because I've given that thought. People are, and I've written some of these in the past, and there's nerds out there like me that would, you know, are thinking of how do I do the common store of a column in a database, and is that different than a COBOL copy book, and how do I match and merge all that? And they can do that, and they often have these scanners where they can scan all that list of, 
you know, whether it's AWS on the cloud or an old Cobalt copy book or, a, or you know, in the cloud Oracle versus on-prem, et cetera, et cetera, and store then to that common meta model. So then you can publish it out. Um, and or it can take from these tools specific repositories. So you're, if you're using an ETL tool, you can get the source of target mappings. If you're using a data modeling tool or a BI tool, it can source from that. But um, having worked with a lot of these tools on all sides, I've worked for data modeling vendors and I've worked for metadata repository vendors, often it's good enough. The, the, I'm hearing the, what do you call it, the, uh, the thunder and lightning from the vendors not letting me say this. Um, maybe just the data modeling tool is enough. I mean, don't, you don't always need to buy a full-on metadata repository if you're just looking for your tables and columns for some relational databases. Maybe an HTML report from that is, is enough. Maybe your ETL tool has enough visualization for your short stock mapping for now, right? Maybe if you're a business glossary, just put it out in SharePoint and get people using it before you buy anything else. Because uh, these things do have a price tag, and they're awesome. Love to use them. But especially as you're starting, you don't always need to do that. At the same time, you know, don't start a massive global data governance program you know, with Excel spreadsheets because that's probably not going to scale or Google Sheets or you know, whatever. Um, and then the other thing that's often forgot, forgotten, and I think in, in our data diversity type presentations, we get so inward thinking with metadata in terms of in inside your organization. And a lot of my companies and my customers are doing this uh, external. And, and you saw in the, in the users of metadata that we talked about earlier, it could be government organizations. You could be doing an open data initiative. You could be doing B2B data sharing. So are there kind of metadata registries? Are there standards you should be comparing against um, to really do kind of standard XML or metadata exchange across organizations? I mean, this is a dense slide that we could spend a whole, whole webinar on. I know we want to open it up for questions, so we won't. But it is worth thinking of your metadata architecture, not just your data architecture, if that makes sense. You know, how are we, what is our ecosystem to manage metadata to manage our data? And that's when we start sounding crazy with all our meta levels, <laughs> but it is important to think about. Um, so again, just a quick su summary. Metadata is a, such a simple thing to understand with a funny name, who, what, where, why, when. A lot of people from both business and IT both create it um, and consume it. Uh, data governance is that nice way to get those roles working together and kind of have the, both the carrot and the stick. Um, and then technical metadata and how you architect it is as important because it really helps that human side, right? The be better tool you have for these people to use, it makes it easier. But just think of that wisely um, and try to automate try to automate as much as you can and then allow humans to do that, that valuable part of really creating that human metadata. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Shannon, just a, a plug for next month. If you want to talk about net data quality, please do, and then we can open it up for questions. Donna, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation as always. And uh, thanks to both of you for the great presentations today. Just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. Um, uh, Sean, the first question coming in here is, uh, is for you. Do you have a connector to Encorda? Oh, you're on mute, Sean, if you're speaking. I'm on, now I'm off mute now. A yeah, you're good. <laughs> and, sorry, can you repeat that, a connection to what? Uh, in Corda? Um, You know what, I don't know. I can uh, take that as an action item. I haven't personally worked with that one. We, you know, we have over 125 connectors though and growing, so I'll, I'll look at that and see uh, see if that, see what um, what the team comes back with. But I can, I can follow up on that. Awesome. And another question that came in while you were talking, um, and Don, I know you can speak to this as well, is how do you distinguish between data catalog and data inventory? Yeah, I actually responded back to that one in the chat. Um, and, and, and I don't, you know, Donna, I think it'd be great for you to respond in as well. You know, my definition was our dis distinguishing factor between it was, you know, think of a data, data inventory is really a list of systems where your data is stored or derived from and, and, and kind of a technical metadata, if you will. And then a data catalog is more from a business view and represents what data is available and, and how it's being used and who, you know, who has access to it, et cetera. Yeah, no, I think that's a great example. Um, and I think it's a bit of an evolution. Inventory is just that. If you think of just in the business sense of an inventory is a list of your stuff. You know, a, a catalog is more like think of your product catalog that you might see in the web from Amazon, right? It has some context. It's an easy way to search. It's more business friendly. 
um, it has some kind of you know business context around that. More of a cat, you know, your 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 inventory, the list of stuff, and your catalog is really a way to present that in, in a better way. From a rules and responsibilities perspective, who should be responsible managing metadata and overseeing metadata is consistent, complete, and accurate? Donna, you want to start us off on that? Um, yeah, I think we talked about it a little bit in the presentation, but it's a variety of roles depending on the on that's where governance comes in to really create these data stewardship and ownership. So from the business side, it's probably your business stakeholders, the people actually creating and using the data would be responsible for the business definitions. From the technical side, it's your data engineer or your DBA that's going to create, be responsible, your your business intelligence architects who's responsible for creating that technical uh, data structures and the lineage, and then your architect, data architect, is often the person that creates the models or may, might help support that glossary. Sometimes your your group is big enough, you have a metadata architect that might just be responsible for things like the repository. Sometimes that architect, data architect, can kind of wear many hats. Um, or sometimes the business can, you know, some of these tools are getting easy enough where the business people or the data governance lead can manage the glossary and things like that. It really de depends. But, you know, governance is a great way to flesh that out. Sean, anything you want to add there? Uh, no, I, actually, I, for me, it's, it's it's a very difficult, you know, question to say, give you a definitive answer, right? I, I've seen organizations be extremely successful in having someone, you know, on the IT side owns part of that, are, as well as the business side. I've seen it done by committee successfully. So I think it depends a little bit on, on you know, the, the culture of the company. Um, the one thing that standard that I have seen that seems to be pretty consistent though is if there's pieces around governance, so like CCPA, um, then you know who owns those CCPA terms tends to be a group that's focused on that compliance and, and drives that. So we typically see multiple um, business owners or uh, you know owners of, of the glossary and the term, the standard, um, whether that's in the business or on the IT side or even on the legal side. So what are the good practices to capture metadata? I joined recently in a new organization and there's no metadata captured. Uh, I'll jump in quickly and then I'm sure Sean has um, input. So yeah, there's a lot from the technical point of view, there's so much that can be automated and I think that's a way you can look like a hero really quickly. Um, either a data modeling tool and or a data catalog or glossary can often literally just scan these things and create that inventory or catalog depending on which tool you choose. And that's such a nice way to just start of even what I have. Um, and then, you know, things like a business glossary is often something you can, you know, people have to populate it, but picking something that everyone wants to know and getting those right stakeholders and start to populate that quickly is often a nice way to get people kind of understanding what metadata is. Uh, often the, the business metadata has that bigger impact because people get it a little better and that, you know, it's more manual, but it's easy to just kind of spin up quickly. I don't know, Sean, if you had other points on that or thoughts. Yeah, uh, so in that one, I'm going to be obviously biased. I think, I think the, <laughs> I think the, the, you know, the, the, the best way to do it is, is, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, Irwin or, or, you know, another solution, but to, to actually go after a solution that can connect all your sources and catalog them and auto document them for you. I think that's the first step pretty much any, any organization needs to take is to understand what data you have and where it is, and then you can start building on it from there. I love it. I think we have time to slip in another question here. You know, um, what are the good practices, uh, excuse me, I've already said that one. Um, I have multiple copies of data in various areas without much of a business need. Um, what can we tell our team members business to accept or delete redundant data? Um, what's a good process to reduce redundancy without affecting existing processes? Ah, that's a tough one. Um, I, I, you want to be careful about that. I think some picking, uh, I, I think picking something small to begin with that people start to understand the impact because out of the gate that just seems so abstract and going to a business person who's busy, you know, trying to get sales driven to say, you know, we have redundant data fields. Then great, go fix that IT. Um, but trying to show what that impact is and just pick one small thing that's going to be visceral. You know, we have three customers 
um, customer records for the same person. We sent them two campaigns, and now they canceled their product because we looked stupid, or you know, so, something that's small. And then, and then, I think you mentioned process in there, and the question really do a holistic look at that. Look at how the business process is that affected that. What data is? What the sources are? And do your impact analysis before you fix it, because you can break things by trying to fix it without yeah, getting without that getting impact. That. So, really understand the impact of it. Get the buy-in from the right people. Do it through governance, and then fix it in small little pieces, because it's a big thing to fix, but you want to get that buy-in first. Sean, anything to add to that in that last minute here? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that the biggest piece is the impact analysis, and I think that's where the lineage comes in, right? You need to understand, you know, it's one thing to have duplicate data, but, but it, you know, is, is that data, you know, where is that data being used? And just because it's duplicate doesn't mean that those two pieces of data, those two data elements aren't used in different areas for different reasons, things like that. So, you know, just because it looks duplicate from a, you know, a, a data management standpoint, you need to understand the impact of it. And I think that's where the lineage comes in to, to understand, you know, where that data, how that data gets federated out to your organization. I love it. Thank you both so much. But I'm afraid that is all the time we have for it. And thanks to all the attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I just love the chat and the web and the questions that come in, as you all know. I, it's so fantastic. And uh, just a reminder again, I will send a follow-up email again by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording. There's also a question, uh, Donna, about past webinars. So I will also include a link to all the past webinars from Donna. You can check all those out on demand at, at your convenience. Um, and thanks to Erwin for sponsoring today. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks.